Welcome to the neighborhood. And today, the neighborhood happens to be at Westbrook Fire. And I am thrilled to be sitting here with a dear friend, known him for a long time, worked with him for a long time. Uh, uh, just, a, just a great, uh, great person. When I, when I think of Jerry, I think of a great storyteller. <laughs> um, because he can, tell, he can tell an awesome story. But the thing of it is, once you get to know Jerry, all the stories are real, <laughs> and he can he can just he can just tell a story. Um, so, firefighter Jerry Pino. Good afternoon, Blake. Thanks for coming to the neighborhood. It's good to see you. Well, thanks for having us. Uh, it's an honor to be here. It's an honor. So, um, uh, we're gonna we're gonna play this real easy. Sure. Um, I would just like to know about you, <laughs> and you kind of kind of walk us through. Um, I like your your posts when you. Uh, when you put stuff on Facebook, mm. um, you end it with, tell that person you love them. I do, yep. <laughs> um, and there's a lot to be said about that, and I mm. read a lot into that. Sure. Um, maybe more so, because I'm a pastor, but uh, sure. it is, uh, that, that means a lot. And uh, people can draw strength from that. And I know that you have a fairly significant history mm -hmm. that allows you with heart to say that it does so yep. I would like for you to talk about that um, I think I'm blessed the way I grew up first of all uh, we weren't rich um, we realized later on in life you know growing up I was uh, the oldest of four and uh, I had brother and two sisters my mom and my dad and you know saying I love you was just part of our, our, our was normal. Sure. And then, of course, as you become a teenager, especially a male teenager, and, and you know, in a small school system, you know, you have that awkwardness of saying "I love you" to your dad and stuff, and that awkwardness of, you know, love is instantly we think romantic. Right. And I think as I got into my early 30s, um, I was working with you at United. I had gone through some personal life stuff, and a really good friend of mine. Uh, was kind of calling me out when I was having a bad day. His name's Mike Allen, super guy. Uh -huh. And uh, after we went back and forth, he knelt down on his knee and he said, Jerry, I love you. And uh, so we started laughing, you know, and I'm like, here's Mike, you know, saying I love you. <laughs> and it kind of sat with me for a good thing because we can love everybody. Sure. There's a love for everybody. There's a love for a stranger. There's a love for a human being. Uh, you know, I, I don't like the word hate or enemy. Nope. And uh, one of the things I've always saw is we can be different. You know, you and I can have absolutely different opinions on everything from the weather, the color, religion, clothing, but we can still be the best of friends and we can draw from each other, right. learn from each other, and I can love you for respecting you. Sure. You know, and I think that was kind of where that came from, tell that person you love them. And I think when we treat people that way, um, you know, I have no problem telling people I love them because, well, what's our work? That's right. You know, since, since I've been in this line of work, um, I get paid to go out every day yep. and do what? I don't think there is a, a nationality across this world that doesn't want their kids to be good people and go help. Right. Right? That's correct. And so I get paid to do that. So I can't fail, right? You know, if you look at it, like I get paid, I got, you know, benefits, and they're like, Jerry, we need you to be good to people. Sure. And of course, in our, in our job, we have tough nights. You know, there are, there are calls where, you know, we, we can't tell that person you love them because right. they're trying to harm us. Yep. They might be doing it inten intentionally or unintentionally. Right. So of course those things happen. But, you know, for 90% of the time, if we walk in with that attitude, I'm here to help, um, it, it's always got me a lot, a lot further than walking in sure. with a different attitude. Yep. And I think the big thing that's always helped me is when people dial 911, it is a crisis to them. Yep. And I think, the, you know, we talk about burnout and we talk about... Uh, you know, bad attitudes as we go through our careers. And, of course, we all sit in the front of a truck someday, especially those in the ambulance or the, yep. the poor fire engine when we're sleeping and we got to go get my knee hurts now, you know. And what we forget is, yeah, I mean, really. 
Like when my kids broke his collarbone, I tried giving him a Diet Pepsi. And then when he stood up and his shoulder was like this, I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, well, this is going to go over well with mom. So I get that. Sure. But what we have to remember is, is we see so much. The emergencies to us are a lot more critical, sure. a lot more you know, uh, significant. But it's our reality. You know, if your reality of a bad day is the water bottle has a leak in it, sure. that's, a bad day. that's a bad day. I'm not going to say what my bad day was and what I saw one day because, no, we don't need to share that. No. You know what I mean? So I think, you know, like everyone else in this career, of course I've sat in the front of the truck going, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? <laughs> but when you get out, you got to take a breath in. And, you know, one of the things, uh, just recently I dealt with a, a patient where their needs weren't being met. And they were continuously using the 911 system. And it wasn't because where they were staying wasn't using the right words with the, the hospital we were transporting them to to let them know they just couldn't take care of that patient's needs at that level. Sure. So I was able to sit down not sit down obviously but I could have with the, that staff that the fourth time I picked this person up in so many hours so many days and said what's going on here this is a cycle what are we doing and at first there was a little bit and then I said no I'm not saying I'm not taking them I'm not doing it but why are we doing this so many times and when they voiced that well we can't care for them because of their level of ability I went oh well that changes the whole deal because an emergency room is for life-threatening things. Heart, lungs, bleeding to death. Right. That's not happening. That paper that nobody can read at the bottom of, because it's like this thick, made by lawyers with all those words, <laughs> says, we saw, this is what we think. Please follow up with your physician. And what we forget, too, is here's this person that just went through the whole experience of an ER visit after an ambulance ride, gets this paperwork, and now they're like, what? what Sometimes did something change? Did it, did it help? Did it not? So I, I try and tell my students, which it's weird for me to have, you know, because I was a student, uh -huh. you know, I've been precepted, uh, I've been the new employee. Um, it's weird for me to have students, and it's an honor. You know, I, when we worked together at United, um, I remember when Scott Latulip came up to my bedroom door and knocked on it and said, we'd like you to be a field training officer and a preceptor for inter <laughs> intermediates. Sorry, intermediates at the time. Right. We won't go there, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, EMTs. And I was like, oh, really? Like, that was an honor. Like, thanks. And so I take that very serious when I have a yeah. student. And um, my last medic student, um, the honor with him, and uh, I, I won't say his last name, Jeff, the honor of him, the reason he was given to me was because he was smarter than me. He was a complete genius. He had spent cool. tours serving our country. He had degrees. He's, he's a gifted person. He's talented. But Errol, his knowledge was trauma in the military right. and then what he had learned you know, before he left. And what, he was, what I needed to do was show him how to work on an ambulance sure. when somebody fell down and went boom. And, yep. you know, we see the fire and the bleeding, but what we don't see is helping somebody up, making sure that their refrigerator door is closed. Uh, is the throw rug in the right place? Right. Is, can they be home alone? Sure. Do we need to call their family for them to tell them? You know, open the door theory, just open yeah. the door for somebody. Right. And that's what I had to show him. And at the end of our, our uh, he became part of our crew to the point where after he left, one of my, well, the chauffeur at, at our station came in and he's like, hey, it's uh, 10 to eight, where's Jeff? You know, he's running late. And I went, he, he's gone now. And he, he was like, oh, yeah, that's right. Because he had just become so part of the crew, you know. And uh, we, we got to meet after. And, uh, our, you know, what he told me is between us in a good way. You know, but it made me feel good that I showed him how to go out and, and I mean, we got the best job in the world. Sure. People are calling us at their worst day. Yep. And if we give that respect back to somebody, we'll get it back. Yep. You know, and That's not right. on every call, absolutely. No. But 
I think the biggest thing for me when Jeff walked away, you know, I've had a couple, you know, some successful medic students and some successful, oh, how many EMTs and intermediates slash advanced now. Mm -hmm. It's cool when someone turns around and says, thank you for showing me this. Sure. And it's not necessarily the medicine or it's not necessarily the technique or the knowledge. It's just kind of how to facilitate through this career and sure. still be 43 and maybe started somewhere around me, we won't say, you know, 1996, <laughs> I've been driving an ambulance. I was a real ambulance driver. So when somebody calls me an ambulance driver, I'm like, hey, thanks. Yeah, I do drive the ambulance. It's not as much now, though. I mean, right. you know, as a paramedic, it's so cool with the light. <laughs> you know? So take us back then. Um, sure. You, you have a lot of, um, you have varied experience. Yeah. It's not like yeah. you have, it's not like you, you, you know, you've talked about working at, at United mm -hmm. and you work here at Westbrook. Um, you're not a, you're not a two or three uh, uh, employer person. You've been around. You, you yeah. have seen some stuff. Yeah. And with that, because of that, you are then able to precept someone like Jeff and give him that. So, so take us back I, I see and what you're bring saying. us up sure. to where we're here. Um, I'm very honored to have started as just a common volunteer firefighter in Jay. So yeah. people will call you a, call, uh, a, fi a volunteer, yeah. but we were paid. You know, when we went on the call, we got an hourly rate. Right. So technically they call those paid common, right. but nothing makes you get up out of bed, right? right. So that's the volunteer <laughs> part. Um, I was a junior firefighter. Uh -huh. I was 14. Wow. Uh, yeah. Um, it was a time in my family's life where uh, my parents were going through a divorce. Um, there was some upheaval in that, and it, you know, it wasn't a, uh, a, you know, this wasn't something you're going to see on Jerry Springer. But you know, it was. I was 13 and was like, well, eh, this isn't very cool. Right. So uh, I grew up on Pino Street, and I was walking down over the hill, uh, and my neighbor, uh, Mike Schenk, was washing his pickup truck, and he was on the J Fire Department. And I knew they had a fire station. Like, I didn't even think they did calls, right? Yeah, cool. And so I helped him wash his truck, and he's like, well, what are you doing, young Pino? And I said, nada, you know, nothing. <laughs> he's like, well, I'm going down to the fire station. You want to come down? And I was like, sure. So we washed a fire engine. Well, wow, that thing was pretty cool. <laughs> and I'd end up driving and pumping that truck and pulling an air pack off that truck before my days and Jay were done. Wow. But um, he says, well, we used to have, his sons were all junior firefighters. And he's like, you should do that. And I'm like, Bleh. Well, what do you do? And he's like, well, we've got grass fires. You put out the grass fire. So, I mean, I'm watching, you know, back then we didn't have the internet, which right. might be a good thing, right? <laughs> Jeez. But uh, <laughs> all we saw, uh, Woods fire to me was you watch California on fire. I'm like, whoa, that happens in sure. Jay? Like, yeah. no way. <laughs> yeah, no, clearly doesn't. But, no. um, which is good. And uh, so, so then he says, you know, at structure fires, you, you know, you change the air bottles or pull hose. You know, you're, you're basically just a helper. And uh, I was like, yeah, sure. So I applied, and the joke at the fire department, they used to, like, raise your hand and vote you on. And uh, the joke was is I was too early because I had to wait for my 14th birthday because I was, like, a wow. week. Uh, they <laughs> voted me on in March 1, and I had to wait till my birthday, the 12th. So I've always remembered when I started. Uh -huh. And on March 14th, I got my year. And uh, that very first day, the, the, my first fire chief said something that stuck with me my whole life, and... Uh, just last fall, uh, he called me and I told him, I've lived by that. And uh, I, he gave me all this gear. I had the three-quarter rubber boots, this big coat, this oh, wow. helmet. Yeah, you should see the picture. <laughs> Show it to my girlfriend. She'll dump me. <laughs> it's not going to be on the January calendar, right? <laughs> big glasses and big ears and this helmet. So the good, the good part was is... Uh, I kept standing there, and Ron Schenk says to me, well, there you go. And I'm like, now what? Like, <laughs> and sure. back then, you, you got given a Plectron, which, you know, mm -hmm. everybody under the age of 40 is now Googling Plectron if right. they're caring. That's right. And it was, a, you know, <laughs> basically a one-way scanner that only went off with the tone, and it yeah. flashed, and there was a light, and it, yeah, it was crazy. Rattled the raptors. Yeah, it was yes. bigger than your TVs back then. Right. <laughs> so, uh... I said, well, just show me what to do, and I'll do it. You know, send me to the training, because it was the first time I heard training. And I said, well, I'll, he'll give us, we'll give you training. I'm like, oh, all the training, make me, make me great, you know. And sure. he says, well, I can't. I was like, well, what do you mean? <laughs> like, you just said you can. <laughs> you know, I was 14. I was shaking at this point, like, oh, my God, you're already giving up on me, right? <laughs> and uh, he says, I can give you all the training, 
But if you don't have it, you don't have it. Wow. And I was like, wow. He says, it's, it's either part of you or it's not. Yeah. And I, you know, at 14, you're like, so you're saying I don't have it because, you know, you look on TV and you see what a firefighter on TV looked. And I was like, well, clearly that ain't Jerry, right? Like, holy crap. Like, you look at real firefighters now and they still don't look like one. <laughs> so I, I took that, you know, and for the first couple years, you know, I was kind of milling around with it and I'd show up and, you know, it was. And then one day there was a call that I missed and it just resonated with me that I should have been there. It was, what? yeah, it was weird. It was like a shed fire. And I was like, man, I should have, I could have been there, but I wasn't, I didn't have, we had got issued these pagers that were as yeah. long as our leg. Right. And I was 14. I was not going to, you know, I, girls didn't like me then. Sure. How am I going to even get them to look at me when I got that big red thing down my leg, right? So I was like, I'm already killing myself with this. So now I'm going to get this pager? Like, oh my. So I left it at home and I missed that shed fire. And I thought, man, I should have been there. And after that, I got really active. Ended up kind of um, getting put in charge after a while of, of the, they call them hot shots, the junior firefighters. And yeah. So we do training and stuff. And then as I um, turned 18, I followed another. I think the thing that, uh, I, the two greatest achievements in my life are my son and my daughter, Allie and Trevor. I mean, cool. yeah, they're, thank God for their mom. And uh, I call him the prince and the princess because I feel like a king. Yeah. And with my life, with the people I've met, you know, you and Dan behind the camera. And so Scott Luciano, who I won't go through the chits of how he got onto the J Fighter department, but we were stocking shelves at Food City in Livermore Falls. And he's like, well, what's this firefighting stuff? And I'm like, well, you know, there's hoses. And so he comes in with an IQ of like 1,600 and like blows me away with, you know, well, these pumps work like this and that. And he goes to the Maine State Fire Academy. Oh. And that was big for us up there. You know, he went to a nine-day academy and then he went to Orono, became a full-time career firefighter, retired as a captain. And I'm like, whoa, man, up, got up my game, you know. <laughs> so when I turned 18, I went to the fire academy. And I came down here to Southern Maine, actually, for the first time. You know, I, I didn't know there was anything below Portland. Uh -huh. And uh, I was in a nine-day academy in Biddeford, 1995. I met firefighters from all the way from, you know, Fort Kent. Uh, there were guys from Farmington, Winthrop, Saco, Biddeford, Standish. I didn't, even know Sta I didn't know how to spell Standish, let alone, <laughs> is that a town? Where is yeah. it? But the career guys at the time, you know, it was very limited in Maine back then. Sure. Uh, they were really good to me. I was one of the few call guys, and I was definitely one of the younger guys. It wasn't a lot of 18-year-olds kicking around. Wow. And so I was very quiet because, you know, shocker, right, Jerry, quiet. <laughs> and uh, there was an incident one day where I earned everyone's respect real quick. And uh, we almost uh, had somebody fall off the roof. And there was a guy that ended up retiring here when I got here to Westbrook wow. who was with me on the roof. He oh, was wow. the ladder instructor, uh, Captain Jerry Preventure. And so I grabbed the guy as he went off the roof. What I'll tell you was, is we were, there really was no Jerry the Hero. So Jerry the Hero was hanging onto the ladder and you put your arm through the strap of the air pack. Yeah. And I'm going to be very honest. When he slipped, I don't think I could have held him if I was hanging onto that little strap. Yeah. But because I was so small compared to him, I wasn't comfortable on the ladder, so I'd actually put my arm through it and grabbed onto the rung. So I was locked into the ladder when he fell. Oh, wow. So he wasn't going anywhere. Nope. So I, I was able to hold him until Jerry came down. Well, everybody was like, well, the kid was paying attention. We'll, you know, let him ride. And <laughs> there was another guy there by the name of Don Flanagan, you might remember, and Dr. Don. Joe Roy. You know, sure. so you kind of see where Jerry's like, I've been kind of blessed through life, sure. you know? Like, so I came back from the fire academy, and uh, me and my, I got engaged um, in my early 20s. was still living in Jay with my fiance. We got married, had my son. I went up to the rank of captain, did a lot of training stuff. Um, I was very fortunate. I uh, had a lot of friends in Franklin County, especially from, uh, really hooked hooked in good with a bunch of the guys from Farmington. We did instructors class. We did, uh, we made a county instructors group where they ran firefighter one and twos and I was wow. the coordinator and they, you know, so everyone kind of had their little function. Sure. And then 
uh, me and my wife both were working in Lewis and Auburn. Um, as you know, I was not a career firefighter at this time. I was working for a dialysis center as kind of their operations person, if you will. I was doing the inventory and water monitoring and I was driving ambulances and I was a little EMT and thought I was not really good. And, uh, but I enjoyed it. Sure. You know, that's how uh, my EMS career, we were at a fire meeting and this guy named Joe LaHood walked in. He was working for Community Emergency Services. They're not even an ambulance anymore, I'm so old. <laughs> And uh, he said, we need drivers on the weekends to drive paramedics around. And I didn't have kids at the time, so I'm like, well, driving an ambulance ain't that bad, right? I'll drive you around. Sure. That's how I got an EMS. Wow. That's how I got into an EMT class. <laughs> Carol Pillsbury was my instructor. Wow. Yeah. I'm telling you, man. Wow. I'm, if I ever fail, <laughs> look at all the people that will like, come after me. That's right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's how I got an EMS, and I really found a passion for it. And uh, I, I wanted it to succeed so much. And then uh, with some changes and stuff, I was like, you know, it's just, I'm going to move. I'm not going to be a part of this anymore. So I was like, yeah, I'm not going to be an EMT. And Joe said, well, why don't you come work at United Ambulance? And I'm like, I can't work there. Like, you got, like, city lights, and I'm from Jay, and, you know, I... And the per diem, I didn't even know what per diem meant, and he wanted me to do it. Like, I was like, is that physical? Like, am I, how's this going to hurt? And he's like, no, you just put shifts in and work once in a while. So I did, and just fell in love with it. Sure. You know, United was a great place. So many people there that just wore a uniform, but were fire chiefs, lawyers, yeah. doctors, sure. uh, RAF guides, uh, yeah. firefighters, just... Mm -hmm. I, you remember the people, the people behind the uniform are amazing. The resources that were there, was the things you learned. And because Lewiston Fire did the fire, Lewiston PD did the police, United did the EMS, we all, that's what you did, and you helped each other out, you know. And I, I really liked that. It worked yep. really well. And, uh, man, I really grew. Sure. And then I remember one day I was coming out of the, the midnight to A shift that we all used to uh -huh. adore. I was getting ready to go to the dialysis, you know, I was down in the locker room, and this guy named Dave White came in, and uh, he says, Jerry, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to work. He says, well, I think you should come work for us. I'm like, I do work for you. Like, <laughs> don't you know who I am? Like, I'm here like 30 hours a week, Dave, you know, like, I like you, but apparently I don't exist. And he's like, oh, you should put in full time. Well, back then, remember, they didn't hire anyone that wasn't a paramedic. No. And I was an EMT, so I wasn't even like on the, like the you know, because, you know, paramedic, sure. intermediate, right. yeah. carry. <laughs> so uh, I was like, well, uh, Dave, well, you really don't pay attention. I'm an EMT. And he went, so? We and I went, well, he goes, we're going to try and hire some people and we'll get you to be a paramedic. So apparently United that year went EOE, and that's why they offered me a position. And... Uh, <laughs> It, you know, I remember going back, my wife and me, we made the decision together because I was taking a cut in pay, and, but I loved it. Sure. I ate it up. You know, I had so much fun. I loved working, working with the people there, working with the fire departments, the, the, you know, because it was Lewiston and Auburn, you had the, the urban, and then you were out in green with George Ferris, you know, on a farm accident, right. you know what I mean? Or yep. Gary Sacco down in New Gloucester, you know, like, sure. you know, God, God bless and God yep. rest Gary. I mean... All these people we got to work with, it just, yeah. just ate it up. And that's how I learned. United was the first place I learned about that table. Because that kitchen table at Shift Change, yeah, they tear people up once in a while, which that's something we need to get rid of, you know, in our sure. line of work. Yep. You know, like, if we want to tear each other up, let's vent or go through the proper channels or one-on-one, -on -one, right? Sure. But there's a lot of good that happens at those tables. Sure. And I, I used to look forward to shift change, you know, coming in a little early or staying a little late and having that cup of coffee. Or at night, you still had that coffee because it's united and you're going to have calls. Right. right. And so you found that bonding. Yep. And it was funny because you knew everyone's first name and you might not even know their last name That's and right. it didn't matter. Because yeah. you cried together, you laughed together. Yep. And as I started my you know, becoming more and more uh, senior there. I kind of opened some doors as not being a paramedic. And yeah. we, when we got nationally accredited, I was 
honored by being a committee chairman of the All Hazard Committee, which was a planning thing. And you know why I got it? So I went through an interview process of nothing. I didn't show up for a meeting, went out to dinner with my wife, and came back to work and had an email that they had put me as chairman. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so I had to redo the MCI plan, the pandemic plan, right. which Jerry didn't know what a pandemic was back then. Sure. Hence 2020, I know now. Right. <laughs> and uh, I like, had to read about pandemic and epidemic when we made those plans. And it was guidelines, you know, what to right. do in a crisis. MCI plan they had at the time was like a Bible of proportions, you know, like right. this big. And yep. remember we came out with like three pages and some, yes. well, let's operate how we operate. That's right. And of course, I'd love to take all the credit for that, but no, I went online, found a nice plan. <laughs> How do we all think about this and made it United? And so from that, running that committee, I got some, some nods and uh, award through Maine EMS for that work. I was nominated for a merit award. And the thing I told everyone was this award isn't for me. It was for everybody on those committee. Sure. Sean Cordwell made the best firefighter rehab plan I had uh, ever seen. Sure. I mean, it, it was phenomenal. It went into chat rooms. Back then, chat rooms were big, and I don't know if they still are, but... It went into that chat room and it was all around the country. People emailing me, we want the plans for this, we want, you know, and we had a doctor help us with, you know, the vital signs. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tim Hardy from Farmington, who's the EMA director, would come down from Farmington, you know, from my past working. Right. And he came down and worked with us. And I called them subway meetings. And all these people would pour in from around. And it just became such a think tank. Uh -huh. And you can't take credit for that. No. You know, you, you, what were you? I was the chef and the scheduler, and then I would line it up, and I remember the email group got so big, I had to have two email groups. <laughs> it was All Hazard Committee 1 and All Hazard Committee 2, because I had to forward it twice. And it actually, we worked with the smaller towns that were all either true volunteer that don't get paid, or pay call by the hour, or career, and because of my past in Jay, I knew what it was like to be a volunteer, a pay common. Yep. So you understand the lingo, the understanding. You know, the, I remember, um, you know, Gary Sacco was a dear friend of mine, you know. And he one day, um, everyone will believe this, yelled at me on a call and was like, Jerry, why does the ambulance come take the patient and go to the hospital? Like, you don't even talk to us. And I was like, what? Uh, how about we take care of this call and I'll come back after, right? <laughs> so, uh, and he, all he, he always wanted the best for his department. That's all he ever wanted. Yep. And he became an EMT after becoming a chief, so it was new to him. So we sat down and I explained to him, well, when we come down from Lewiston to New Gloucester, you know, I got 20 minutes and I got to get back because, you know, there's two, two kind of big cities and a bunch of little towns that need our four ambulances and... <laughs> Once we get down here, we need to pick up the patient and go. Yeah. And what I think a lot of people thought was is, you know, that we, I'm sure we had our bad apples like everywhere, but really they were just intimidated because we saw chest pain every day. That might be the first chest pain they saw in a month. Right. So after I got explaining that to them, I said, hey, you guys do all this when you get there. When we get there, we toss them in the truck and drive to the hospital. And if you guys want to roll with us, remember we always used to say, jump in. Sure. Someone pick you up at the hospital. Check That's it all the way in with us. Yeah. And so from that, we started doing a little uh, training for Green, New Gloucester, Sabatis, um, Mechanic Falls at the time. You know, it was, it was really cool to work with those little towns, but the benefit was coming from Jay. Right. You know, having that background of what is a pay column and what is a volunteer, yep. and now being a full-time United person, uh -huh. and my table got bigger. Right. And that network and... You know, it amazes me when it comes to a bad call, my phone number is published everywhere for stuff like that. Sure. And I will never say how many times it rings in the middle of the night or in the, in the middle of the day. And I, I always get back to them. And I think the most successful part about those phone calls is, is we have been there. Sure. And who else better to talk to than someone who's been there? And when you have that table and you push that information out, yep and somebody uses it, to me that means more than, you know, that's, 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 that's what we've done. That's what we've done right? Because we need to teach all of us, it's okay to say, this is hurting me, yeah. this is affecting me. 
I mean, you and I both can say our personal lives at times have affected our jobs. Sure. Our jobs have affected our personal lives. Yep. And we need to be able to say, this is, this is happening. Yep. And the, un the fortunate, unfortunate part of our job is, is we're, we're out there yeah. in a high, high stress situation. So it doesn't mean we're, our job is better than anyone else either. You know, I, I always go back to a story of a lady that I used to see. I'd walk, when I lived in Lewiston, I'd walk to work. And I'd always stop in at Cumberland Farms and get my coffee, and I'd walk to work. And uh, the girl I was dating at the time, you know, we'd kiss each other in the morning, and we had one vehicle we shared, and yeah. I'd walk to work. We were, you know, worked out. I know I used to be in good shape, right? <laughs> and uh, so I'd walk to work, and every morning I'd get my coffee. She, always nice pleasantries to the lady behind the counter. Sure. And, you know, so one day she said, so what do you do? I see you about every third day, and you're walking. And I said, oh, I'm a cab driver. I work for, you know, city cab. And... Uh, our paths crossed in an emergency. Uh, her daughter was having a seizure. And uh, when I walked in, her eyes got really big. And you know, we took care of her daughter and got to the ER. And she walked up to me. And you know everything was fine. And her daughter had never had a seizure, so it was scary. So we worked through it. She smiled at me and said, I knew you weren't a cab driver. <laughs> and I said, well, we pick people up. We drop them off. And you get a bill eventually, right? So it's not really a lie. It's a synonym. Right. And uh, she said, you are a hero. And I said, I'm a hero. I said, by the looks of your apartment, how well you keep it and how loved that is and how hard you work. Because she was always at work. Yeah. For who? Her kids. Sure. Who's really a hero here? Right. I get paid. Yeah. That's a hero. So, you know, with that said, our job, though, is high stress. Sure. Because right now, even though I'm off duty right now, mm -hmm. you know and I know if something extremely bad happened. Absolutely. We go to work. We go. We have to. Yeah. You, you don't leave your people, you know, number one, you don't leave your family. Yeah. Because, you know, everyone always says, well, everyone says brother, sister, brother, sister. You know, what that really means is exactly that. Right. I mean, our, of course, our generations had bigger families. Yeah. So, yeah, you don't have to like your brothers and sisters, no. but you got to love them. It's just, it's part of it. So I think that's the part, you know, you're there for your people. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to like each other. That's, that's what we have to teach people. It's okay to be different, have different stuff, different ideals, different expectations. As long as you're not hurting somebody, right. who cares? Sure. Our job is to take care of people. Like, and that's why I go back to, we have the job everyone's parents wants you to do, or anyone. Sure. Anyone that raised you or had anything to do with raising you wants you to be a good person. Yep. We get paid, so we can't fail. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like right. We actually get evaluated. Are you a good person to people? <laughs> so with the United stuff, I, that was the first time that table meant something. Yep. I got the coffee pot. I got the hanging out. It went to lunches and dinners. and You didn't have to like each other. Sure. You yep. loved each other. That's right. hmm. So you mentioned... Um, uh, I mean, we've we've all been at home, and we've gotten the page that uh, mm. MCI, and sure. we drop what we're doing, absolutely, and, and we boogie. Um, uh, you got that, I did in Farmington. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I didn't. I, they didn't call me. They're still wishing I probably didn't show up. <laughs> Uh, I will put out the disclaimer. Uh, Tim Hardy, who was the acting chief, said, please don't ever come back. No. <laughs> and uh, Chief Bell was like, why are you here? No. Sure. Uh, well, when we lost Alan Parsons at United, yep. do you remember when they sent that page out? Um, I was working. Okay. Uh, I know I you were working. working. I know you were yeah. working. Because you remember who came back. I do. Yeah. And what happened that night was is it was just before we started paging. Sure. And Jamie, the dispatcher, God love her, best singer ever, yeah. called me because she knew I lived close and said, I need people to come back. Yep. There's been an ambulance accident and people are hurt. And from that experience, um, we, you know, we'd practiced MCI stuff yeah. and I, you know, we did good. You know, yeah. you and the duty crews got the injured people to the hospital. Yep. I initially went to the hospital uh, to actually bring the life flight crew out to you by ground. When that wasn't needed, we were looking, do we need to defuse the ED, sure. you know, move people? And then what we did is we sent ambulances to assist MedCare with, you know, 
uh, we actually, yep. me and uh, one of the other employees, I think it was Todd, went up and actually did a transfer for them so that we could take the load off them. Yeah. So from that experience, um, and another experience at United, um, when we lost a sheriff's officer, um, it's always resonated with me when one of us goes down, everybody needs to show. Right. And uh, that day when, when Farmington happened, I was actually here, Westbrook. Um, so I, I left United because I was like, well, you know what? I'm going to go uh, become a paramedic <laughs> and go be a fireman in Southern Maine, <laughs> you know, firefighter paramedic. So I was very gracious. I uh, got to work in Gardner. If you could take the heart of EMS and put it, those guys were, they care about their town, they care about their patients. They actually got an award right after I graduated paramedic school for just that, you know, uh -huh. being a good service to their, yeah. to their, to their area. It was, it was awesome. And I loved working there. I loved that valley. Um, it just, feasibility for my life, I needed to be down here, sure. you know. Because honestly, it's the pay. You know, you just make more money down here. Right. So after you know leaving Gardner with a heavy heart, it was very gracious to come here to Westbrook. So many good people here on the floor. We we're very fortunate. We have a lot of uh, like I'm old compared. We have a lot of younger <laughs> people, and they're great. They love the job. They like to do it. It's awesome. And uh, so it's nice to see that. And that day when the Farmington explosion happened, I was doing hose testing and uh, you know my captain came up to me and said there was an incident in Farmington and I was like don't worry about it and he's like well they said it's pretty big I said uh, those guys are they're firefighters they, they got this they'll put it out and I hadn't spoken to them and you know you just get distant in time and I hadn't seen them in probably five years six years and uh, but I still knew they were the I mean they're their firefighters yep. they're, that's their job and they do it very well they're, they're uh, known around the country, really, because of when people go there to do training and stuff, they've earned that respect. Yeah. And uh, I, they taught me how to fight fire. Mm -hmm. I jumped on a line up there a couple times and put fires out on a Farmington truck. And yeah, I liked it. And uh, on Fridays, we'd sit in someone's driveway and drink soda. Voice in the ceiling. <laughs> It's never any EMS calls, no. right? right? So there's that kitchen table again, and it was a driveway. And every Friday night, I'd usually find myself in Farmington with my friend and his wife and the chief and the guys from the department, my wife at the time. We'd drink soda, sit in lawn chairs, and you know we'd go camping on the weekends to the fire convention. And there was that bond again. Sure. You know, there's that table. Yep. All of us were different. Came, uh, I'm pretty sure in the history of Franklin County, there was a civil war between Farmington Fire and Jay Fire, and nobody <laughs> told Jerry. So when I hung out, you know, in Farmington, I'm pretty sure there was a sniper looking for me at one point. You know, because you know, firefighters were all. Hur. You remember, even you know, EMS and fire back in the day was like. Hur. But we're different. Yeah, no, we're doing the same thing. Like, what's wrong with you? Right. If we're together, there's more of us. So uh, anyway, that, that taught me a lot about the fire service. Yep. There was a different look for me for the fire service. Sure. Yeah, we're not at a fire right now, but we can still hang out. Be, you know, and we can be different and do different things. And Obviously, that meant something to me. Yep. So bounce back down here when that explosion went, and I told my captain... You know, Farmington's got it, and I winked and walked away, grabbed a two-and-a-half, because I'm just a fireman down here doing my job, right? And uh, I laid the two-and-a-half to do the hose testing, and my phone was going off. Boom, boom, boom. And um, I thought somebody had opened up their availability counter for a per diem department I work for. And when I looked at my phone, it clearly wasn't. And uh, then my captain came up and told me that their firefighters were in the building. And I said, I got to go. Yep. And he said... Okay. And when I left, I got, I called a couple friends and I was on my way and they said that some of the firefighters were headed to Lewiston. So I stopped there on my way through to see who was there trying to get, and Lewiston Fire was already there with all their shift taking care of them because of that kitchen table. Sure. Because those guys in Lewiston had trained with those guys in Farmington and weren't going to let their brothers sit in that hospital alone. 
And when I found out there were people going to Portland, I called John Keenan, who's my lieutenant now. Congratulations on being promoted, by the way. <laughs> I said, hey, we got firefighters from Farmington getting, going down to Maine Med. Their families are going to be getting there from afar. You know, they're not used to this. And he was on the phone with Portland Fire. And Portland Fire, again, amazing. Sure. Every, any second that there was a firefighter from Farmington or their family at that hospital, there was a crew there for them. Absolutely amazing. Yeah. I mean, you can't, you don't plan on that. Nope. But again, that was because of that kitchen table. Sure. It was because people had trained together, people knew each other. And when I got up to Farmington, uh, there's, there's things in life that will always stick with you. And when uh, the deputy chief, Tim Hardy, walked in, he had an N95 here. Uh -huh. He was talking on his radio. He's in his hitch. He's got blown in insulation in his hair. His cell phone's ringing and he's answering it while he's doing the radio. Sure. And I'm like, well, there's a real fire officer. Sure. If anyone ever wants to know what a fire officer looks like, yeah. because not only was he now the fire chief, sure. he relayed, I was just put in charge. You know, me and the town manager have had the talk because the yeah. fire chief was injured. Sure. And uh, he said, I don't, my command staff has been taken out. And he said, uh, I'll take whatever anyone can help us. And, you know, there were people in the room when he said that. And I'd gone there to be on the floor and just throw my gear on a truck. And, of course, the guy saw me. And they're like, well, go upstairs. And maybe you can help communicate with the people coming because not everybody knows everyone. And, well, you're Jerry. You know, you might know somebody. <laughs> and So <laughs> that's how I got up there. A uh, good friend of mine, James Butler, Captain Butler from Scarborough, was with me. He met me in Lewiston. We drove up together because we both grew up at Jay. And he's about 10 years uh, younger than me, but has had the same experience in the fire department, but now is, um, he's done a great job in Southern Maine. You know, and it's grown his career from that. And it was amazing to me how many of us went back home wow. because of that wow. kitchen table. Sure. And so when uh, Deputy Chief Hardy said, I'll take whatever you can get, I was going to give him whatever I could give. Sure. And... Uh, we met the next morning as a group, and you know I stayed up there and helped with uh, whatever needed to be done. Yeah. Uh, it's an honor for all of us to be here, and it is our privilege to serve alongside the Farmington Fire Department. From all corners of the state, firefighters have come to the town of Farmington to serve in the place of those injured in Monday's blast. We know if anything like this happened where we're from, they'd have been first in line to help us. Many of the firefighters who have come to help are originally from Farmington or a neighboring town. Jerry Pinu is one of them. He now works in Westbrook, but grew up in Jay and previously worked with many of Farmington's firefighters. When you need help back home, you come back home. It's a well-oiled machine, as various teams from cities like Waterville and Augusta take on 12-hour shifts. Responding to calls, just as Captain Michael Bell, who died in the explosion, and the five others still hospitalized would have. We haven't skipped a beat since that day. Farmington Fire Department is here. The town of Farmington is protected just as well as they were. And I think the big thing was is when guys from across the state, and uh, excuse me when I say guys, it's yeah. generation thing, that means girls and boys to me, so folks. Yeah. <laughs> but when the firefighters and officers showed up from across the state, yeah. they were there to help. And I have never seen, in my life, I have never seen the fire service in Maine. It didn't matter if you were volunteer, career, didn't matter what you chief, it didn't matter if you were chief of Portland, chief of Harmony, Maine, Chief of Waterville, uh, so many, uh, Woolwich, those guys, I mean, they bailed us out. I don't know how many, you know, coverage. And the thing was, is all people wanted to do was help. Sure. Dan called me with a grill that we used for two months. We fed people. I mean, we just, I, if I needed it, I could call, but I already had a list because of people, what they had offered. Sure. And that wasn't because of, well, everyone felt bad. It's because everybody respected everybody that was down right. because of that kitchen table, sure. because of those training sessions, that respect. 
And when all those people would come, before they leave, they'd turn around and look at me and they go, so this is what it feels like. This is what it means to be somewhere, to do our job, to be a part of this family for not money. And I don't know if anyone will ever realize as horrible as that incident was because we lost Captain Bell. Yep. And, you know, we I'd delete, I'd delete everything we learned from that to have Captain Bell, you know, sure. here, obviously. Yep. But I think to honor him, what came about was the state came together, the fire service. I had crews from New Hampshire call because they had been firefighters in Maine and Nashville, New Hampshire, one of their lieutenants called. He's like, what, what, what do you need? Like, you know, he used to work here. And he worked in Lewiston. And he went down there. And so guys that were in an explosion in Arizona, same kind of explosion, called one day and said, here's our number. Call us if they need anything because this is what's going to happen when they get home. Sure. So I think what I've learned is that kitchen table, you know, that's where you kind of put everything aside. Yeah. You know, like when, you know, you and I work together, it was, how's your family? How's your kids? How's sure. life? What are you doing? You kind of put down all that other stuff for a while and you just kind of be human for a minute. And you kind of learn about the person that you're walking out that door with because you know and I know things can get pretty hairy back there. Right. Or we're going to be trying to, I mean, I know you're a pastor and I, I appreciate that, but I, my job is to keep everybody here and God, you wait, right? Like, don't touch the light in my truck. <laughs> so my, my stepfather, who's married to my mom, he's very religious and I, he always says you know God loves you and we pray for you and I said I hope he hates me because I keep everybody here in a joking way you know because <laughs> that means I'm doing a good job That's right. and uh, when we go to do that we lose a lot and we put a lot out there we got to be able to talk to each other and say hey it's okay and you and I both know we don't get a we don't we're not successful because when your time comes, we all, I know your time comes. We're a check and a balance. You know, clearly if I've ever saved a life, <laughs> I mean, I'm not really that good, so it really wasn't their day, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> right? So it, I was like, you know, it's kind of like McHale's Navy. Oh, they're here, yeah. Uh. So, you know, that's, and we gotta stay humble like that. And when we teach that at the table and, you know, when we, when we have those talks and we, we understand it's okay to be different, I think that's kind of how the, the whole systematic way that we've, you know, everything's a system now. Well, sure. we have customers. Right. Yeah. I don't like customer. I actually had a, a boss one time, we were talking, he says, well, the customers, I said, it's not a customer. It's a patient. Yeah. I'm sorry. I disagree. Sure. I do agree with the mentality of customer care and all that, but they're a person. Right. And that's just, that's a difference of opinion, right. right? It's not wrong or right, but I can't, so I always tell somebody, because you know when we put that really big seal on a drug box that breaks in like two seconds? Sure. It's really hard to break right. <laughs> for the Zofran <laughs> at 3 a.m., for the person who's puking because they drank too much, and uh -huh. you know it's all their fault, but you're like, ugh, what if that was your mom? Right. What if that was your dad? What if it was one of my kids having the worst day of their life and you're the person that's, right. that's there? Or what if every day of their life isn't good yeah. and you're the best five minutes of that person's life? Is it worth cracking that seal, giving them that Zofran? I, I think we change our thought process when we look at it from that. So I think, you know, with that mentality that mm -hmm. it changes, like I said, how you look at things. Sure. And so that kitchen table, when I was a part of Farmington, um, when Deputy Chief Hardy said he needed um, that kitchen table that I had sat at, even way back at Jay, I used to go fishing with this guy named Rob Kutcher, who's, I guess, kind of a big deal where he is. And I needed a, we needed a PIO officer. And I, I called half a ring. I don't think he's ever answered my phone calls, right? <laughs> and half a ring he answered. And Rob Kutcher was there to help us with that. And Jason Decker came from Augusta, who was a, you know, grew up in Farmington. And you had Joe Carroll from Westbrook Fire who showed up. 
and helped us. James Butler, Captain Butler, was there helping with code enforcement through the whole incident, even when he wasn't there, you know, via email and working with the town. You had Ron Warren, mm -hmm. who dropped off, you know, a van and supplies and anything I needed. Yeah. Um, that kitchen table, you know, you had Ben Guile, Justin Schenk, all career firefighters that live in that area that were there the first night. Steve Hall from Portland. Uh, Lieutenant Hall was there before I got there. Yeah. And we were all there in Farmington at noon. That kitchen table, all those names are all different, but we all had one goal, and that was take care of that family. That's right. So you look at the success of something, and I always say it's, it's not, there's never an amazing person. Right. There, there never is one amazing person. Mm -hmm. If you have somebody that you think is amazing, they're actually just good, and they are surrounded by excellent people. Sure. So anytime you can do that, that's how you build that kitchen table. Sure. You know, and that comes up, and that, that showed with that, with that incident, mm -hmm. um, everybody that got called or called was there to do whatever was their, their speciality was, and they offered it. You know, yeah. the local businesses up there, the hospital, the college, you know, called and all the businesses gave food for so long, feeding firefighters from across the state. You know, over 80 departments came to staff the station wow. while people healed up. And I mean, they got rocked and taken out in two months. They're taken back over. I, sure. I don't even think that's possible, but they did. Yeah. And they're doing it very well. And, sure. you know, they moved forward. Yeah. So when you look at something like that and you can take a breath and you're a part of the United Hazard Committee, the Franklin County you know, instructors, I mean, you see all these things were built from a kitchen table. Sure. You know, yeah, maybe it was a driveway. Might have been a, I'm not going to lie to you, we might have had a few sodas in some places. <laughs> um, but, at, you know, United, I had the subway days. We'd have subway sandwiches, and everyone would come for the hazard committee. Um, Any time I've been honored to be part of a group, it's because that kitchen table. People have come back, you know, that experience, that you know, that relationship, that bond, mm -hmm. uh, it always just amazes me. Sure. You know, it, I think when, when we try and teach, we, we were too formal sometimes, you know. Uh, of course, we're in the middle of, a, you know, a, a global pandemic, so there's right. a lot of Zoom and, sure. and uh, PowerPoint, and we were already headed that way with technology anyway. Right. And it's good. You know, it's a good resource for, you know, but not all the time. No, no. But you still need that in-person. But sometimes semi-formal is okay. Yes. You know, and that's one of the gentlemen I work with, uh, I work pretty in Freeport, and he wants to do a class when he retires and just to show new firefighters how to do groceries for the shift, how to cook, how to take care of cast iron pans, cool. how to clean a toilet. You know, like living in a firehouse. You know, like, you know, at United, we were blessed. We had a janitor. You know, right. God love Armin, you know. Yeah. But we were just too busy. Sure. You know what I mean? We were, we, you know, you never went back to the shop. I mean, you were always doing calls. And I think those are the things that as we go through this life, how do we, you know, it's kind of like, you know, everyone's worried about leaving a mark. You know, it's not about shiny trucks or buildings or plaques because you know what? All those things fade and rust. You know, they all get replaced. Did you give something to somebody that they're going to give to somebody else? And even that person probably will never know your name. It doesn't matter because that person is going to affect somebody and it's going to be a positive because something you did, said, and that, that's not a hard thing to teach, but you can't do it by paper. You have to do it by showing. That's right. You know, um, I think as we go through this career, as we use the kitchen table, there have been places where there was no kitchen table, yeah. and it wasn't as functional. It wasn't as, you know, you didn't have that bond, you know. I've had people call me before that I've met three or four times and thank me for getting them lined up in this career and doing things, and I'm just like, I don't even, you know, I don't even remember your last name. Sure. I'm sorry, but, you know, thanks. You sure it was me? You know, we all look the same in these outfits. And, but that's something. Yeah. You know, 
Nobody cares about awards. I think we all write each other awards now, sure. right? But what if you actually met somebody? You know that feeling we all get when you meet somebody and you know you somehow effectively made their life better or something. And that high, I don't think you can do anything about. And I think that's what keeps us going. Yep. So if we can keep that, I mean, we all have our days. Don't get me wrong. Sure. Especially, you know, recently, it's hard. Mm -hmm. You know, I myself, I started dating for the, it's been a long time since I started dating. So this poor girl's had to put up with me for a year during a <laughs> pandemic shutdown. You know, God bless her. I've got two teenagers. I'm divorced, but me and their mom have a deep, really good relationship. But, you know, we're all navigating her uh, husband, the kid's stepdad is awesome. So, and everyone's got their personal tragedies this year as we all try and function through this. Sure. And then all of us are still out here working. Right. You know, you know I, I kind of giggled this summer. You know, the summer was nice. Everybody could go camping, fishing, stay safe. And then as, you know, cold comes, you know, everyone's going to go back inside. So that's when... You know, it was, well, round two's coming. And I'm, I was like, uh, round two? Like, <laughs> did round one even end? Like, I'm in a coat and mask and, you know. Yeah. So, and, you know, nobody was ready for this. No. And, and that's okay to say. Sure. So, at the end of this, as, you know, the vaccinations are getting out there. And, you know, we're learning to live with COVID. And that's the thing. Learn your enemy. Understand it. And let's go. Move on. That's right. That's why we had vaccinations for everything else, right? Sure. It's, just, it's just new because at no time in our lives, obviously they've said it a zillion times, in a hundred years has the world been, hey, hold on, right. nothing you're doing matters. <laughs> right. We got this thing. Yeah. And it's scary because there are people that have so many different experiences with this thing, and it's invisible. And here's the, you know, here's the thing, when you're on a football team, and I'm your coach, and I coach you well, and you play well, I give you a trophy, and we all high five, and there's your victory. What's the victory here is nothing. You stay healthy, and you never see it, sure. and you pretend it never existed. Right. That's a hard thing for people to wrap yes, your head around. You know, think about it. Yep. So what do I gain by winning? Nothing. Right. Really, you gain your life. <laughs> you know, you gain health, and you gain not being, you know. I was talking with my friend today. He lives in the Carolinas. Uh, he used to live in Texas. He's from Connecticut originally, and uh, his brother-in-law is fighting for his life with COVID. And his sister-in-law was just finally upgraded to stable. So those of us that have those experiences or when we're in the ambulances and have those experiences, you know, in Westbrook, I, you know, I came back from a cruise. It was probably like the last boat they let in in March. <laughs> like we flew in, was like, what's going on? Woke up the next morning, and the airports were closed, and I was like, well, wow. hello. <laughs> you guys had a wow. chance to get rid of me right there, and you sure. didn't. They opened it. I couldn't believe it. Like, right there, you could have got rid of me. But then, you know, we were a hot spot down here right in the beginning. Sure. It was yeah, Westbrook, right. Portland. I mean, it was, so our crews were, you know, so we can understand why everybody was like, okay, everyone time out, slow down. But you also could understand through these times why if you live up in, you know, Greenville, Maine, and you're like, well, it's not here. Right. Absolutely it's not, because nobody's dragged it up there yet, so right. we don't want to drag it up there. Yeah. So can you imagine living in Greenville, Maine, going, well, good luck to New York City and Portland. It's not right. here. Yeah. It's hard to understand that, sure. and I, I totally understand that. But we, instead of yelling and screaming, have to be able to communicate and say, yes, I get you don't understand that it's not there, and I don't want you to deal with this. Let's keep it down here. You know, the last thing anyone wants to see is freezer trucks lined up at your hospital. That's right. And, you know, it's Maine. We have a healthcare system that on a Friday night with too many car wrecks and too many things, we're overwhelmed. Sure. So we don't need two, 300 people in the hospital with this extra stuff. Right. So it's tough. You know, and I think my first time in, obviously, <laughs> in an ambulance, I usually only get yelled at because of, you know, that 10%, the hostility people, the, the, you know, two, three times a year. This year, it's every call. Right. Because we're telling family, you can't go with this family That's member. Right. So you have got to be very, you can't just come in and say, nope, sorry, you're not going. You're not going with your family, your loved one. You've been married for 70 years, and no, I'm not taking you to the hospital. 
you, you got to line it up, you know. Sure. And the hospitals have done a great job. You know, they can call now, get all the information. I don't know how many times I take people's cell phones, have them call their loved one. You know, we're not an airplane. Use your phone in the ambulance, sure. right? We're not going right. to crash. <laughs> and uh, you're not driving, obviously, you're the patient. And if you are, uh, maybe at a level three pandemic, we'll let the patient drive. Sure. You know right. what I mean? It's like, hey, whatever. <laughs> but... Uh, you got to do different things. Yeah. So we're constantly, you know, we're constantly changing, changing. And it's every call. That's right. And you remember when this was really new, every time you went to a facility, it's like, well, we weren't doing that an hour ago. And they're like, no, yes, we were. And you're like, oh, no, no, I was here an hour ago. <laughs> so, you know, there's a lot on everybody. Right. And it's tough. I'm going to tell you, this took years out of my life sure. of working in the EMS. I, this... I went, well, hello. So uh, one of the things we're going to have to do is work together. We're going to have to plan and make sure that, you know, a lot of these agencies are going to have to understand we're going to have to do something because there's, there's going to be a lot of change. Yeah. You know, there's going to be a lot of people. It's, I had a, one of my other uh, students who was, uh, served in, uh, uh, overseas and was in, what they, he would call downrange, you know, get shot at and shooting people. He said, it, it's going to be a lot like coming back from war because all of a sudden you just experienced all this and nobody understands what you experienced and you're going to be like, I'm done. Sure. I'm going to do something different. And I, I never really looked at it that way. And, then, and then a guy that I have uh, mentored, he's mentored me through the years, uh, Mike Joyce works up at United, you know, I can, I can assess any trauma patient and start an IV on anyone. You know, he's taught me that. Sure. He had an interesting statement when uh, he, he was at my house recently. Social distance visiting, of course. Sure. He said, you know, kid, it's like in Vietnam when I was growing up. He said, you had the people fighting the war, and then you had the people in Germany. Main first responders are kind of like Germany. We, we have bad things that happen. We're always ready. It hasn't got that bad. We've had hot spots. And it, it's, yeah, and it's hard, you know, how do you express to the public when they don't see, we're glad we don't see freezer trucks, sure. but here we are with gowns and masks and going through all these protocols to keep people safe. And how do we explain to the public we're burned out and I can't do this anymore? Right. It, it, it was, he goes, it's, it's kind of the same thing. There's a war down here in your rural, in your urban areas because of, you know, the density and that. And then in the outlying areas, thank God we don't have that. Right. But we're still fit for battle, if you will. Yeah. And I thought that was an interesting take, yes, you know. And so through this, we have to work with everybody. And the kitchen tables are so important right now. And yes, there's so much going on in 2020 and 2021 so far. There's so many issues and different events. And sure. it has been... Probably, I thought September 11th was going to be our thing. Right. Like, right, where were you when 9-11 happened? Sure. Right, the country song? Yeah. Everybody knew. I thought, I remember my grandmother talking about Pearl Harbor, because I read about it in a book. Yeah. And, you know, she talked about that, and I went, yeah, I don't get it. She said, the world changed. Okay, the world changed. How does the world change, Meme? Right? Sure. Of course. She just always beat me in cribbage. What does she know? <laughs> you know, she goes, she's retired. What does she know about the world changed? I didn't know what that meant. 9-11, I knew what the world changed. Sure. Guess what we just got seen again? Another change. Another change. Another change. So we're going to change again. And, you know, we have to, you know, as parents, if you have children around you and you're, you know, grandparents or you, you know, take care of kids, we have to keep our faculties to keep them understanding that they need to be able to make choices and right. take information in. It's okay to be different. It's okay to say I love you to people mm -hmm. and not, Forget about that. Right. And then as senior people at work, we got to tell these, the, the newer people, hey, th this is, can you imagine coming out of paramedic school into this mess? God love these people. Yep. I mean, right. eh, you might get clinical, you might not. Hey, here's a drug box. That's right. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> and then you walk in and someone's like, save my, <laughs> and you're like, yep. oh, well done. Well done. At least we had preceptors, you know? And what I think we need to remember is those kitchen tables are so vital right now. Yep. Um, I had a, uh, one of my uh, fellow Westbrook firefighters call me this weekend. He took care of a patient. He's a newer medic. 
And he's like, hey, do you got any contacts? Like, I don't know how I did on this call. I was really trying to gauge it. Man, he knocked it out of the park on this person. Totally did the right treatment. The person's improved at the hospital. I actually kind of knew somebody, so we found out, you know, how they were doing through the proper channels. And the good part was I got to give him that feedback. Sure. And he knew who at that kitchen table to call yep. because it was plaguing him. Did I do the right thing? Sure. And did I tell him... Uh, this is what I would have done, this is how you should do it. No, what I said was, well, tell me about the call. He told me all about the call. I went, good job. He did everything right. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like folding a shirt. Everyone can fold it differently. That's right. And then when I called and got the report and I told them what happened, I'm like, nailed it out of the park, man. And that's what we have to remember. Mm -hmm. And that's why these kitchen tables, the driveways, you know, after we get done this interview, me and you are going to go get a cup of coffee and talk about some old United times. Right. And Dan, when he was my preceptor and they wanted to kick me out of Delta, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it, but that, you know, that's what means something to me. Sure. I, I get to hang out with Blaine today. Yeah. You know, I, I told my girlfriend uh, last night on the phone before I said, you know, I love you and good night to her and the kids. I said, uh, man, I wish you could be there tomorrow because she's at work. I said, you, it's just... Those are bonds. I mean, yeah. I hadn't seen you until last fall for years, yeah. but That's it didn't right. matter, did it? No. It was a hug, how you doing? Yeah. And I think that goes back like to me. you ambushing me with tell that person you love them. <laughs> well done, by the way. <laughs> um, we can always share that. That's right. And in that respect, yep. granted, there are things we probably didn't like about each other or disagree about. Who knows? Who cares? but we always have that love and respect for each sure. other. And I think the biggest thing is when we can crawl out of this time period, we're going to be dented. We're going to be pretty stove sure. up. And it's going to be the kitchen tables. And I'm not, you know, and, and, and you need buy-in at all levels. You need, you know, administrations, directors, whatever your agency or department has for, you know, a chain of command. They're all different because we have so many different, you know, um, presentations for response in this state, which is unique all in itself, and they need buy-in, and they're doing you know a good job. And but we really need to see what I saw last fall. Yeah. I, we need each other to step up for each other. Mm -hmm. It's like what baffles me is when you have an award ceremony. I'll send you five trucks and an ambulance so you guys can go have an award. Well, if what if you guys just need a day of downtime because COVID just ran through your building, or sure. maybe you had a bad call. Let's give these guys a day off to meet with counselors and send an engine and an ambulance and some staff to go cover you. Right. And let's get the Blaines and the Lori Martel Sears in there, and let's make that part of the program, right? right? Let's, I mean, because when, when I first got into it, it was just at the end of, you don't hurt, you don't cry, <laughs> you, you do it, right. to... I remember coming off shift one morning, they're like, you're all going to see a counselor. And we're like, what? And they're like, yeah, well, mental health is new, and we're doing it. And I was like, are they going to commit me if I talk, right? right? Sure. And I remember meeting with that counselor after a call. Nobody knew what to do, and no disrespect to this counselor. They were probably 23 out of college. And I walk in after a 48 at United Ambulance with what happened, why they sent us there, and I bleh, and she's like, oh, that was a horrible accident. But I asked you what happened at home. And I said, well, you, yeah, I was a, I'm a fire captain at home. And we had a code K, which is a fatal car accident. So then I got my wife and we went to dinner. And, and <laughs> that poor person's face just was like. <laughs> and, and she's like, I'm going to call a colleague that can, you know, that could probably maybe identify more with what you're going through. Sure. And I'm like, well, I'm OK. I'm just telling you that's why we're here, is we're supposed to talk about it. Yeah, that, they never called back, because like, they were probably like, <laughs> Lori wasn't there yet. You know, She was still working as a police officer. And sure. So you know, we know that position, you know, for the people that don't know Lori, she was a, you know, a blue pin police officer who she was a mental health person who went to the domestic violence, the mental health calls. She'd talk people down. She'd check up on them. I mean, they were so far ahead of the times with that. What a loss when that went away, right? Yep. And can you imagine having a Lori Martel Sear in a fire department, right. at a police department, on an ambulance? You know, wh whatever that, that service provides, yep. because they do the job. They train to do the job. 
we don't have to start at the beginning. We just start right here. That's right. And that's the resources, I think, that will help. You know, looking at it as a, someone who's on the other side of our career, mm -hmm. that's what we need to implement. Sure. You know, we need to get those people, you know, the Blaine Bacons. You know, the uh, Jeff Lakes from South Portland who showed up in yep. Farmington with the, with the teams, the sure. crisis intervention teams. Yep. And Steve Simonson who was in charge of uh, the IFF team at the time. or yep. Whatever you need. Sure. It was whatever you need. That's what we need all the time. We, right. need, we need us to be able to say, hey, this isn't a good day. Let's let's bring this in and give these guys and girls a break. Like let's, we're gonna take we're gonna take the watch today. You guys go do what you need to do. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you go have a picnic, you know. And that's the other thing. What we've we've changed. Remember, well, you're all gonna go meet at a weird conference room that nobody's comfortable <laughs> in with bad coffee, some waffle that we think is good, and always had a blueberry muffin from yesterday that Dunkin' Donuts was gonna throw away. Right. Now, these strange people you never met, tell them what happened, and you're like. It was okay, you know. <laughs> and I won't tell you the first time I debriefed after a bad shift at United, we did it wrong. Sure. We got off shift and went and did it wrong. And yeah. we'll just say we drank too much soda and we should have done it differently. Sure. But I wasn't going to some conference room like I saw with bad muffins and people I didn't know. Mm -hmm. So, hey, maybe your department needs to go. Maybe you have a campground that you can go have a barbecue. Because we all know that kitchen table the front of that ambulance, that driveway, sure. you can vent. And you're venting and not knowing it, and you're healing. Yep. That's why I feel bad for police officers. They're alone in their car for the most part, right? Sure. What, a, what a crazy world. Yep. We should have two police officers in every car. So they go from call to call to call to call to call to call. We go to a bad call, we're all together. Right. We're in the cab of the fire truck. We're at the kitchen table. Sure. After a bad call, what happens at Delta? You all milk to somewhere, and it's in the kitchen by that That's counter, right. isn't it? That's right. Because there's always that counter. Yes. And there's that table. Yep. I don't even work there, and I can tell you. I bet that's where everybody kind of sucks. That's where everybody comes back what into What happened? Just like at United. Always to that table. And uh, so my daughter is a my daughter's police officer in Lewiston. No, your kids and are cops and <laughs> paramedics. <laughs> um, but you're exactly right, yeah. because she works you overnight. Yeah. Oh my! And she is, though. Lewiston is one of the best places that you can work as a police officer. Absolutely, because you know we can go out on a call uh, on on a assault GSW anything at three o'clock in the morning, any morning, and there'll be ten cruisers there before we before we roll in. One of the greatest experiences, right? Yeah. There, there what when I learned. When we worked together with LPD at United, what an awesome relationship. Yes. Awesome yep. relationship. Yep. But, the, but you're right. Those officers are, are alone. Mm -hmm. When you and I worked together We're not in alone. a truck and we went out and we'd come back from a bad call, we had each other. And then we got back to the kitchen table and we could, everybody else would say, hey, what, what, what just what happened? happened? And we could, we could talk about it. Mm -hmm. Ariana doesn't have that. That's right. Because she, she is alone. That's right. Until she, until the end of the shift, when she gets back into the into the duty room, and, and they're able to, able to talk about it, or if it's bad, you know, the LT they can, she can talk with the LT mm -hmm. or 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 uh, the but CEO. But Lewis the PD is no. probably never busy at shift change, right? I mean, <laughs> right. absolutely. There's yeah. no time, and what better place than at sure. work with the people you know? Right. Yeah. You know, and if we could teach that in a uh, positive. Sure. It's not, you know, we used to call it complaining and suck it up, buttercup. And right. We're, I almost threw somebody out of my ambulance one day. <laughs> he was a student. I really didn't throw him out of the ambulance, but I don't think he's an EMS anymore. But I know he's not. I'm sorry. But he said, this is just the price of doing business. And I said, yeah, you know, people die. And the way he reiterated it to somebody else at the station, I took him aside. And I'm like, okay, hey, look, not on my truck. Right. This, this isn't the price of doing business. This was somebody's mom. Sure. Yeah. You know what's funny when you're young? You forget all those people that expired in your truck. Sure. I, I don't know how many times we went to something at United and I'll, I'll be somewhere and they'll be like, hey, Pino, how you doing? I'll be like, hey, good. They're like, do you remember? And I'll be like, oh my God, yes. <laughs> I forgot about that. And you're like, holy God, how did I forget about that? But 
we're, I think we all have a gas tank, if you will. And eventually it's going to get full. Sure. So do we want somebody with a gas tank full to stop bubbling over? Yeah. Or do we want somebody to say, hey, I'm, I'm getting full. Yeah. Uh, I need something. Like, what do I need to do? And one of the things, like, um, I find that keeps me loving the job is I've got to find a project. So somebody's, you know, everyone's different. So like me, for the last couple of years, I send out EMS trainings that people can do independently and take a quiz and, you know, cool. people, yeah, and it's just, I, it keeps me busy in my downtime uh -huh. and it helps people get those almighty, savory <laughs> CEH hours, you know. <laughs> and it's kind of funny, sometimes it's like, I feel like a drug dealer because people call me and they're like, hey, Pino, what do you got for ABC hours? And I'm like, relicensing it to <laughs> I'm like, this is creepy. Can you just say you need some hours and right. we'll, you know, get the training approved and you can take it. But that's, that's my out. That's like, I need to give back a little bit, you know, and that's how I heal from this. Sure. You know, someone says, you know, Jerry, when you, because I'm new to the Southern Maine area. Well, when you're old or do this for a while, because they know I'm old, but they think I'm new to the, yeah. they're like, you know, you're going to get, and I'm like, you have no idea. Sure. In a good way. So. Right. When I look back, what keeps me smiling, liking people, loving this job, it's those little projects that saved me. Yeah. You know, that, and the hazard committee, the meeting I missed, and they put me on it. Yeah, I'd love to tell you I was, you know, I went through thousands of candidates to get that. Now, you ever notice those things that you end up in charge of, or in, you're like, I, what? Right. And, yeah. And, the, and then two years later, they're like, we're going to give you a, no, you can't give me an award. Like, you don't even know how I got this. Like, <laughs> No, they did it. You know, like all these people did this. So I think, you know, that's what's got me to this point yep. is those, and looking back and, you know, when you brought up Farmington again, you kind of tanked me on that, but you're good, you're good. The people that came back to help me when I called them, yeah. it, it was because I saw something I couldn't do. And I said to, you know, Deputy Chief Hardy, I know this person, this is what they could do. And he'd say, bring them in. And he would meet with them and be like, He's a fire officer. He'll look you up and down and know if you're full of BS or not. And every time I brought somebody to him and I'd say, they can do that, he'd talk to him and he'd say, go to work. And sure. guess what? They'd go to work and they did a stellar job. Right. And that was from all my experiences over the years. And me knowing, I don't know how to do this. Yeah. I don't even know what that is. But let's call this person. So I think when we look at stuff, it's like on my shift, we got a guy that he can sharpen tools, paint tools, do tools. I, I think I'd cut myself with a thing. Like I am not a, I don't even know why. I can't, uh -huh. I can't do that stuff. I'd build you a house and you'd sue me when it fell, you know? <laughs> so use that person to do that and I'll pick up the other stuff. You know, I'll do the, you know, use your strengths and weaknesses. That's and right. We learn that at the kitchen table. That's right. And one of the things I learned early on is don't be intimidated by somebody that knows more or is better. Give them credit for it, shine them for it, sure. and make the team better for that's it. Right. And it's just going to make everyone better for it, yeah. you know. So I think that's kind of a real imperative part of the table is learning about each other, right. you know. And and then the other part is is when you have that bond, you're less likely to have that. Oh well, what are they looking for? Are they out for something? Are they out to get me? Or are they trying to self? But it because you're really just a family. That's right. You know, and you're that functioning unit. Which again, we don't have to like each other, but we we just have to work and love each other. That's right. It is. Um, it's all about relationships. It is. And with that relationship that is developed around the kitchen table. Um, we would not be able to be where we are today. No. We wouldn't be able to um, draw on those people that you called because they're going to say, oh, it's just Jerry calling. It was a relationship that you had developed with them. When I went back to paramedics, when I decided to become a paramedic, um, I was 35. Sure. It was a great, great, great thing to do. So I... I did it when I was 36. Yeah, you get so. it. Yeah. I think my ex-wife divorced me again. <laughs> All joking aside, but like... <laughs> but anyway, um, I called a person who was... Uh, in, he was part of the program at the time. He runs it now, which is cool. Uh, he, 
he's one of those guys that uses the force through life like I do. Like, you'll always be like, wow, how did you know that? And you're like, well, uh, I actually don't know. It just worked. <laughs> but he's very, very intelligent. Yeah. And I was on his first code here in Westbrook. We were both per diems 100 years ago. And so we had, you know, lost touch over the years. And I called him, didn't answer, didn't answer. And I didn't realize you had to email him because he gets so many phone calls. So I email him. And then he called me, and he's like, so you're really thinking of doing this? I'm like, yeah, but... I don't want to come in there and people think we know each other and I want to earn this. And he goes, well, yeah, you will. And I understand. And so we went almost a year and a half and nobody knew we knew each other. Wow. Yeah, we went all the way to the summer semester. And he said something. His wife now was one of my partners at United. <laughs> and so, of course, you know, when you're halfway through the program, everyone who's probably there at that point is going to make it. And, you're, sure. you know, you've got that family bond, that yeah. kitchen table. Kind of funny that we have this kitchen table because when I was in paramedic school, I worked with some of the guys here I was in school with, and I taught them maybe how to talk at a, I'll just say it, at a bar to yeah. people that we didn't know. Sure. And they taught me what a thread was on a computer because I thought threads <laughs> were on your clothes. Apparently this is part of your, yeah. But so the program is built over the summer that you have like 30 minutes for lunch and no time. Right. So you, what do you have to do? You have to plan. Sure. But nobody tells you that. <laughs> so I said, well, why don't you bring in bread? You bring peanut butter. I'll bring jelly. We'll bring chips. So every time we'd have lunch on those summer semester days. And I bet nobody even realized what we were doing. I still talked to pretty much everybody in that class. Uh -huh. Kitchen table. That's right. And so, you know, as that summer broke, it was pretty funny because he was telling the story about his wife doing this delivery. And he's like, oh, and Jerry, of course, was there. And everybody was like, Whoosh! <laughs> J J Jerry? <laughs> yeah. Actually, one of your employees, Jess, if you ask her, they thought I was a cab driver for three months. <laughs> oh. All right. Yeah, I showed up for paramedic procedures <laughs> one in a bathing suit because so <laughs> came off the beach. <laughs> it was my day off. <laughs> Perfect. But yeah. So, it, you know, I think looking at every successful group of people I've ever seen, and my paramedic class is, is a really good group. I had never met any of them. They were all pretty much college-age kids. There was another gentleman that was my age who served our country and came back to become a medic. He was already a medic. We just had to make him a civilian yes, medic, I guess. Medic. Yeah, because he clearly didn't do anything over there, right? <laughs> and uh, it's funny. They can show us all this stuff, but you've got to show them how to open a buterol. You right. know, that's why I love Jason. Sure. And uh, <laughs> they gave me faith in all the young people. See, because one of the things I think we say is the, uh, what do they call this group? The... The kids, they call them uh, millennials. millennials yeah. Well, they're owed everything. Well, where do they learn that from? Who's teaching them that? That's right. Right? Isn't it from us? Sure. So one evening, I was sitting somewhere, and we're writing run sheets. Well, typing run sheets now, right? Remember we yep. used to write? I know. In those days? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Remember the stamp at United? <laughs> <laughs> rank, rank, rank. If anyone watches this from those days, they're going to be like, he was in the bedroom right next to dispatch. <laughs> So, and the person said, I shouldn't have to be doing this call because I've done this job for so many years and it's midnight. And, uh, yeah. So I just smiled and I said, so did ditch diggers get to stop digging ditches after 10 years at noon? <laughs> and I get the seniority thing, absolutely. Sure. But we're all firefighters, paramedics, and police officers. We can't pick when people need us. Right. And so that person kind of growled at me and looked at me and I'm like, look who you're saying it in front of. All the young guys. Sure. So what are they going to say in 10 years? Right. So it, it's back and forth. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and I totally understand seniority, and we need to respect that. And that's what gets us to places, you know? Right. It's just like I'm 43. I am not an officer in this fire department. I clean the toilets. I sweep the floors. I check the truck. You know what I mean? That's my role here. And so we have to, you know, you accept what role you play in that team. And, you know, bring your offerings to what you can offer. And I think that's what will get and help all the people behind us. That's what we need. Like, we need to start getting that message. And we can't train by PowerPoint. We have to teach that. My brother, right. I was a fire chief for a couple of years in Little Moore Falls. Mm -hmm. And he called me. And my brother, was a, he's a Marine. He's not serving now. Um, but once a Marine, always a Marine. Right. And he called me. And he says, I'm going to tell you something. When I was a sergeant... I ran, he was uh, on helicopters with the instruments, so it was pretty smart, but sure. don't tell him I said that, right? 
<laughs> and uh, but he shot better than everyone. He ran faster than everyone in his in his group, and he always had to be the best because he led by example. Sure. And he said something to me when I when I uh, was hired as the fire chief. He said, "I don't know what it's like to be a firefighter, but I give you the only piece of advice I have as a leader." And I said, "What's that, Jim?" He says, "On good days, a leader walks behind his people, and on a bad day." a leader, he or she walks in front of them. Yeah. And I thought, you know, what do you know? You're a year younger than me, you know, 18 months younger than me, and the first time I got to Livermore Falls to do my thing, there was a, their evening parade for 4th of July, and there was all these fire trucks in a line, and I looked around and I went, these people don't even know what we look like. So I got out of the truck, shut the door, told the driver, I'm gonna walk in front of the truck so the people can see who the fire chief is. And it wasn't a dog and pony show. It was so they could see who their chief was. Sure. So I walked in my shorts and my T-shirt because, you know, it was July. And I had my, you know, T-shirt on. Before I, I resigned, I had to resign when I went back to paramedic school because you can't be a part-time, full-time fire chief, work at United full-time, have two kids, <laughs> go to paramedic school. You know, I, I really didn't want to get done. I loved working up there. The group was amazing because we had a kitchen table. Sure. Every month we get together and have a big meal together and talk. It was great. The last parade we went to, I got a picture I keep pretty near and dear of my whole fire department walking in front of the antique and marching in ranks in Sweet. Class A uniforms. Sweet. And don't tell my brother, <laughs> it came from him. Yeah. It came from get out, walk in front. Yeah. Show people who you are, not as a dog and pony show. Show them who you are, why you're there. You're the ones protecting them. Right. And then walk in front of your people in the bad times. Walk behind them in the good times. And I think, you know, that's kind of funny because when you're in the military and the officers march in a, in a parade style, yep. they're off to the side so you can see the troops. Sure. Right? That's right. And I, I, yep. I admired that. And, I, you know, my brother really helped me with that. And uh, I try and keep that to some, you know, to, I've gone through a lot of things with that now. And, sure. You know, that was way back too. So yep. as we show those things to people, you can't put that in a PowerPoint. No, can't. Who wants to read that in a PowerPoint? Jerry walked in shorts in front of a truck. Right. Yay. Yeah. But if you saw it, yeah. and you had a cup of coffee with me, and you talked about it, and you see that expression on my face of when sure. the last time we marched, and the people were clapping for my department. Yeah. They were clapping for my crew. Sure. That's something. It wasn't Jerry. Nope. It wasn't Jerry's officers. It was the department. And that's the thing, like, we need to remember is we always have a superlative. You know, there's always somebody who shines. Sure. God love it. We need it. Right. Thank God, because, I mean, <laughs> I need a partner. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, holy crap, somebody's going to show me. The hose is heavy. <laughs> and it's scary when they're bleeding, you know. Sure. Someone's going to show me this stuff. That's right. So, but we need to teach. It's a we. Yeah. That superlative when they come in and they're like, you know, I, I, I had a, one of my guys I work with here now, he's full-time, he's per diem. He comes out into my ambulance. He was working per diem, and uh, we get in the back of the ambulance, and he looks at me, and he's going like this. And he goes, hey, man, I've never been in the back of an ambulance before. <laughs> he was a brand-new EMT. I mean, we were never brand-new, right? Right? I mean, we, no, I mean, I had a stethoscope and a Halligan. Clearly, you no, know, I didn't even know what the Halligan was. Like, so you got to go back to that level of, hey, you need to say, well, this is a stretcher. Yep. And instead of saying, yep, check, check's done. No, no, you got to, this is how we fold linen. This is where we put things. This is, and I think he was a, a superlative that day because what did he say? Hey, I've never done this. Sure. And I got to recognize that and say, okay, let me show you what I, let me show you how not to do things, right? There's that. I, I got a list of that. I mean, the joke at United was when they had that expansion, it was me and Lucian's personnel file, right? God love Lucian and Jerry. <laughs> like, I think I just felt things shake. <laughs> Poor Joe. <laughs> Poor Dave. <laughs> Poor Craig. <laughs> and Mona. God love Mona, you know, when she had me and Lucian on her shift. Oh, my. Jerry, this has been this has been uh, not only a trip down memory lane, mm. um, uh, a learning experience, 
uh, and something that I something that I certainly will cherish. Um, but uh, I hope that for the folks that have a chance to watch this can see the thread that runs from the start to the finish. I, I say I'm not going to do this every time. Um, and every time I end up doing it. So um, folks watching will just, yeah, there goes Blaine again. Um, I do it in the pulpit too. Uh, so um, I, I hope they see the thread. Uh, your comment, tell that person you love them and where that comes from. And with that, it's, it is the love that is shown at the kitchen table. Absolutely. That, that brings everybody together. Because we do get beat up out there. Uh -huh. uh, we do lose a piece of ourselves. And it's coming back to that kitchen table that we're able to get our tanks filled back up. That we're able to heal. That we're able to repair that which was torn away from us uh, on those bad calls. Hmm. And that we'll be able to go from that kitchen table to the next call because of that kitchen table, because of that love. And I hope, um, I hope that's what people see. Um, that's what I have gotten just being, just sitting here and your. If your we, passion. if we use that kitchen table, mm -hmm. that driveway, where we're going to go in a few minutes, sure. there's always a place. Yeah. Where I met my girlfriend. Yeah. There's a, there was a reason, that, you know, you know where I used to go there <laughs> and where I met. Like, those places are a church. Yeah. They, you know, I believe if, if, if there's a God, uh, I don't know who's going to take me, but <laughs> there'll be a fight. <laughs> and like, not up here, not down here, whatever. <laughs> something. They, they'll, in the middle. <laughs> um, there's got to be something. We've got to be able to talk to somebody or something. Yep. And I, I always tell everybody, if it's true, it doesn't matter where we are. And when we go back to that place, that comfort, that home, mm -hmm. that table, that work, we need that place. Sure. We can laugh, cry, mourn, but we got to heal. Yeah. Because this one thing at the end of this we got to do. We got to get those uniforms back on. We got to get back on that truck. We got to get those ambulances pointed out. We got to get the police cruisers ready. And we got to be ready to be grade A for the next one. That's right. And we can't do that unless we use those tables. Yep. That is right. And Blaine, you know I love you. And it is, uh, it's been an absolute honor to have this conversation with you and talk about um, how we've got through, you know, through our lives to this point, my, you know, how my professional career has been affected by those tables. I hope it helps somebody. Yep. Um, I hope everybody um, knows that if they ever need anything, they can call. Sure. And if I can't help, the great part is, is I have a big table. You know. And I can find somebody somewhere. <laughs> but, and, and when... Uh, Thank you. And when COVID's over, we'll get that hug in. That's right. And maybe when the camera's off. <laughs> That's right. Well, thank you very much, Jerry. You're welcome. Thank you for watching. Thanks for coming to the neighborhood. And uh, until next time, where we don't know where the neighborhood will be, but, but uh, we know there'll be a next time. Be safe. Make good decisions. Blessings. Go home as you reported. <laughs>